Hello, mandolin friends. It is so exciting to be here with one of my biggest heroes on the mandolin. He needs no introduction here. I'm sure you know him from his amazing work with the Artist Works website. He's taught hundreds, thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of mandolin players over the past few decades. The great, inimitable, amazing Mike Marshall. Thanks so much for being with us here, Mike. Thank you, David. Thanks for having me on. And I just love what you're doing here. You've been interviewing a whole bunch of us. And uh, well, that's just part of your life. You do plenty of other things. And so thank you for being a cheerleader for the mandolin in oh, countless well, ways. That means a lot, Mike. Yeah. and. And likewise, you know, not only are you a fantastic teacher, but I hope we can get into all the amazing projects that you've been a part of over the many years. The David Grossman Quintet, you know, you work with Psycho Grass, oh my goodness. All the stuff you've been doing recently too. And maybe to kick things off, we could talk about a project that you're kind of revisiting right now, right? The album Short Trip Home with Edgar Meyer, Sam Bush, um, on the record is Joshua Bell as well. One of my favorite records. So hoping we can maybe get into some of that music because I know you guys are hitting the road with that record again soon. Is that right? That's right. We're going out in January, actually, with that. We did a little run uh, last January on the kind of the East Coast, uh, Georgia, Florida, North, South Carolina. I think we came through there. We went up north. Um, so we're going to do the West Coast side of things nice. now and, and, and hit San Francisco and, and uh, I think Denver area. Yeah, it should be a good little swing. It's so fun to play with. Well, it's uh, Edgar Meyer, of course, kind of put the project together. And Sam Bush, my hero, your hero, all of our heroes. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> to get to play with Sam uh, was just a miraculous thing, as you can imagine. And the record was with Josh Bell, as you said, but um, George Meyer, Edgar's amazing son, uh, who I think was eight years old when we cut the record, wow. is playing the heck out of the classical and bluegrass uh, fiddle. And so he's covering the violin parts. And um, it's really been a gas to work that music back up. Mike, you are like the mandolinist I think of who kind of bridges the gap between the aural tradition styles that we play on the mandolin, like bluegrass and, and swing, all sorts of stuff like that, and then the more classical side of music that we play on the mandolin too. And I was just wondering, with this album, Short Trip Home, what was it like having a foot in either world? And, uh, and what was it like you know, getting to collaborate with both bluegrass musicians like Sam Bush and classical musicians in the same session? I bet that was interesting. It was. It was very interesting. And I mean, this is what I've been about since being introduced to music, you know? I mean, I came from Pennsylvania. We moved to Florida. So that's where I discovered bluegrass. I was just taking lessons from somebody, a local music store guy, Jim Hilligus. Actually, he was a great teacher. And he introduced some of his young students to bluegrass, brought us to a festival, we became a band. So from the beginning, I was kind of a visitor to that music as someone who came from the North. And so I've always kind of looked at music this way, that it's just, it's all about visiting a, a musical style. I mean, of course I lived it and I, you know, hung out with all the cats and the late night sessions and endless festivals and <laughs> silliness right down to the core. Um, but it, it was a doorway into music for me, bluegrass was. Mm. But I always had an ear for all different kinds of music. And I, I was right away interested in swing, just like many of us, you know, discovering Stefan Grappelli and Django Reinhardt things. But there was lots of fusion happening at that time, like the jazz rock fusion stuff with Weather Report and Return to Forever and John Luke Ponty and John McLaughlin and all these people who were kind of taking jazz and morphing it with, with rock. So, but I was always an acoustic guy. So, you know, I mean, if you look at even the bluegrass bands of that time, Newgrass Revival, they were pushing the boundaries, you know, here was Sam Bush you know, bringing in elements of funk and and rock stuff. And it, 
the introduction of the long jam, letting solos kind of open up, you know, which was inspired as much by the Allman Brothers and Little Feet as it was Bill Monroe. And so that was always where my ear was, was like, where could we go with these instruments? And so right away I started looking at classical music and st I was studying the violin and adapting that stuff to the mandolin. Um, all the Wolf Hart and the, all those great violin study books from the yeah. late Romantic period, scale patterns. Uh -huh. I mean, as a mandolin player, there wasn't a lot of materials available to us like there are today. There certainly wasn't an artist works where I could just send Mike Marshall a video of myself <laughs> or Sam Bush in that case and say, how am I doing? So we had to kind of get it wherever we could, you know, mm -hmm. um, to, to adapt classical music to the mandolin or jazz to the mandolin. Um, the Berklee School of Music was just getting started, and so there were some publications for jazz starting to appear. The illegal version of the real book was floating around, so we were kind of looking at that and scratching our heads, saying, what the heck is a B minor 7 flat 5? <laughs> I still cool. don't know. <laughs> what is it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so it was an exciting time also, you know, because there was kind of a return to roots music, Mm -hmm. um, in a way that uh, that the movie Oh Brother Where Art Thou kind of did it for your generation, a movie like Deliverance and an album like Will the Circle Be Unbroken kind of busted uh, into people's consciousness the idea of roots music. Oh, American music, yes, well, we do know about that. That's our music. Uh, and so a lot of young people were visiting festivals the hippies were starting to show up at otherwise very traditional festivals. And so there was this collaboration going on between people from the north, the urban centers, and, uh, and the rural folks. And so to me, it was very natural to try to bring worlds together. Mm -hmm. And it's what I've always tried to do. I remember you telling me that your education on the mandolin was learning every Sam Bush note that he ever recorded on an album from like, I don't know when it was, like 1970 to 1980 something. <laughs> and Certainly. What, what was uh, the first Sam Bush recording that you ever heard? Can you remember? I think somebody gave me a cassette of a live recording of the Newgrass Revival. Very bad cassette. <laughs> <laughs> you could hardly hear anything on it. Um, wow. I probably dissected that, and, but probably within six months, their first Newgrass Revival record came out um, with Great Balls of Fire and Prince of Peace, and mm -hmm. with Care from Someone, Lonesome Fiddle Blues, all that stuff. So, I, yeah, I mean, I, I, I admit that I was pretty fanatical, not only about Sam, but just about learning the music. And I was playing all the instruments. So I was also learning Tony Rice solos and Curtis Birch and playing the dobro and learning Mike Aldridge stuff and and chromatic style banjo was just beginning melodic style banjo. So Bill Keith's things, I was playing banjo. Um, I'm not sure I ever figured out or dissected much Tony Trishka, but his records were coming out. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I was kind of doing it all Vassar. I learned every Vassar solo I could get my hands on. <laughs> All nice. the John Hartford records and uh, Will the Circle Be Unbroken, I wore it out, you know. It, I, I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to be those people for you. It can almost be anybody, especially younger generation, of course. They're learning Thiele and they're learning Sierra Jarosz and Sierra Hall. Um, they're learning your stuff. I mean, it, the main thing is to just dive in to this, to whatever excites you. And and learn it, and and then that will that will develop your language, and and I, I'm definitely of the you are what you eat school of music making. 
you know, that whatever you really try to absorb will and absorb it deeply. That's why I think transcribing is so great because uh, I don't mean writing it down, transcribing. I mean, slowly being able to play it, especially I would slow the records down to have speed, you know. In those days, you could play an LP at 33, but it, they, they had a switch on it for 16, which would put it exactly an octave, a little bit sharp, but... Uh, <laughs> wow. <laughs> and so really just go through that stuff and really figure out, like, did he go... Or did he go... You know? <laughs> You know how it is. And you just get that little nuance and how it relates to the rhythm. How laid back is it? How slowly is he sliding into a note? Um, Absolutely. Yeah. I definitely did I did a lot of that kind of studying. And it was ear training. You know, I had to learn the chords, remember them. Uh, and it kind of set me up for the kind of... Um, writing, I suppose, that all of us are doing these days. Mm -hmm. But also it taught me how to learn tunes. So when I uh, showed up at Tony Rice's house to play with David Grisman and they were writing new material, it was pretty easy to exchange. Man, I feel like I have it so easy now <laughs> with the amazing slow downer. I can't imagine growing up and having to listen to things <laughs> an octave lower. <laughs> that sounds... <laughs> really really difficult and just the amount of dedication that you had to have back then to learn stuff oh you'd be surprised it, it, it it's pretty it's not that bad um yeah the amazing slowdown is a great tool i i love it i love it um although i have to admit i haven't done as much work in that regard these days as i as i did growing up i feel um, that way too i don't know maybe it's you go through seasons, but also I feel like technology maybe has some role in it where if it's readily accessible and easy to get a hold of, sometimes you don't take advantage of all the amazing resources at your fingertips. I bet that's true. I feel bad for your generation in a way because <laughs> I think about that a lot. Like if you're an average young mandolin player in East Tennessee and you want to play the mandolin because you saw Uncle Bill doing it mm -hmm. and you just bam, hit the YouTube I mean, it's just an explosion of stuff, and it's right there. I, know. I mean, right away you're finding out about Andy Statman and Hamilton de Holanda and Don Sternberg and Katerina Lichtenberg and Srini Voss and on and on it goes. You know, it's just like, how do you, how do you deal with all of that <laughs> and figure out which of it you actually want to be involved in? I wanted to ask you too in our interview here, like what. What keeps you inspired to keep practicing? What do you decide on what to work on with all the crazy stuff that's available right now? And um, especially for, I guess, adult learners, because I feel like a lot of adults are picking up the mandolin for the first time these days. What advice would you have for folks like that based on your own experience? You know, it still is a, a, a regional uh, thing. I mean, music, you know, if you if you get interested in music, it's probably because somebody around you, you're seeing them play. And so they're probably playing a body of tunes, a body of work that is somehow connected to your society, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Either you're in uh, the rural South and they're really playing traditional bluegrass or they're playing, they're, you're in the big city, but there's a scene of people who are, interested in that music. Or maybe it's a combination of things where, you know, on Tuesday nights you get together with a bunch of cats that sing Beatles tunes or Eagles songs and you're trying to play the mandolin with them. You know, instead of there being so many guitars, you want to get your <laughs> mandolin out, you know. And that's the music you grew up on, so you love it. And I mean, I think that's the only real thing is Where's your passion? You know, if you if you hear something and you dig it, if it if there's an Irish jam in you, in your town and you just are gaga for those tunes, then just dive in. You know, and just one tune at a time. You know, don't sweat it if you don't know all the tunes because I'll tell you, nobody does. Uh, <laughs> I wish I knew that when I first started out because 
That's so it true. can be a little maddening. It's so I mean, I would go to Brazil, you know, and I know a lot of Shoros. I mean, I've probably got my 40 Shoros down, you know. But <laughs> forget it. Those guys go all night. And I mean, I have a stack of CDs of that music that's very deep. And they're playing stuff I never heard, you know. And it's like everyone knows it. And it's just, oh, yeah, that one. Uh, so... <laughs> That, that that's just a deep, deep well, as as any tradition is, if you go there, if you really dive in. Mm -hmm. And so I, I tell my students online, you know, it, it you're all you're just climbing this mountain, you know, and everyone's at a different place on it. You're, there's someone ahead of you, there's somebody behind you. <laughs> and so my advice is always to to find people who are kind of in your level at your level. And interested in the same things you are. Actually, if they're just a little bit better than you, that's great. <laughs> because then you're always learning. And uh, Absolutely. certainly what I did. Well, Mike, what's been like your most recent obsession? Is there any like new style of music or new songs you've been working on that's really lighting your fire these days? It's, it's really not a new style of music. It's this one right here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, quite the opposite. <laughs> You know, it was kind of my COVID project, was to see if I could play that music on the Mando cello. So I've recorded three of them, the whole suites. The third one is being mixed right now. Wow. And the other two are out, actually, on Bandcamp. They're fantastic. You should go check them out for sure. Anyone watching? So number three was great, too. It fit really nice. It's in C. Um, now I've started number four. Wow. And here's here's where the trouble begins. <laughs> At least the the prelude to number four. Number four is in E flat. So mm -hmm. E flat on the mando cello is your third fret on the low string. And and he holds it as a kind of pedal note Ooh. while playing arpeggios in first position. Sounds Octaves. miserable. <laughs> yeah, it's it's pretty <laughs> But when you listen to cellists play it, you know, they, they play the low note, they take a little time, it's, it's played slowly, you don't have to, it's not a burner. Mm -hmm. it, you, you kind of rest on the note and then go get the other one. So I'm finding some solutions. And, and I'll tell you, that music has really taught me how to play the mando cello, because I've had to deal with, like, fingerings. Mm -hmm. It's all about fingerings. You don't necessarily want to play everything in first position because in that music, he usually has counterpoint kind of written in, even though it's written as, a lot of the music is a single line when you look at it. Mm -hmm. But if you really get in there, you realize, oh, this is a bass note, and this is the descending melodic material, and the bass note's moving uh, melodically on its own, mm -hmm. down or up. And so I've got to treat that as if it were a separate instrument. I remember doing that in school. They um they made me get like highlighters and analyze, you know, some of those sonatas and partitas and like use different colors for the different voices that pop up throughout the single line of music. That's really cool. Like getting to visualize it like that. I'm reading a lot about it too. I always have read pretty much everything I can find about Bach and about uh, right now about the cello suites. Um, and of course, listening, watching YouTubes of everyone mm -hmm. I can find and uh, trying to, you know, glean what I can and s listen to the guitarist play it because in a way that's closer to the mando cello being a right. plucked instrument. But I also get a lot of inspiration from all the great keyboard players. And, um, you know, living with Katarina, who's an expert at all of this music, has been amazing. That's like 
the best situation ever, just like living with <laughs> one of the most amazing classical mandolinists of all time. Yeah, that's not bad. I don't have any complaints there. <laughs> uh, the only thing I don't like is the scowl. <laughs> <laughs> You're not going to do that, are you? Oh, no, 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 of course not. <laughs> uh, at least she's honest. That's nice. <laughs> yeah, no, she's great. She's She just, that music comes so naturally to her. I mean, she's from Magdeburg, East Germany, which is where Telemann was actually from. Mm. And Telemann, I believe, was uh, the godfather of one of Bach's children. They were very close. Wow, I didn't even realize. Actually, she just recorded all the Telemann solo violin fantasies no way i just got done editing that so that's in the on the way to get mixed so and cool. that's some crazy stuff oh my lordy <laughs> i mean in, in many ways it's harder than the solo bach because he's does like double stops where you gotta walk it down a lot mm -hmm. and and a lot of sh quick shifting of melodic material so yeah We'll we'll have to get her on to talk about that one. Oh, uh, we need to make that happen for sure. I I have a question for for both of you. I'll have to ask Katarina at some point too. But coming to this music as a mandolin player, how do you try to walk that line between playing things historically how they were supposed to be played and trying to interpret the music on this instrument that you know wasn't necessarily intended for that music or maybe even invented in this form or fashion at that time? Like, what's been your answer? Or is there a different answer depending on what piece or composed you're playing? Well, I, I, I would focus right now on Baroque music and Bach in particular. Well, I mean, one thing we know about Bach is that he played all of these different instruments and he was very open-minded mm -hmm. about a lot of instruments. He rearranged his music often for other instruments. And so I think we, and I don't think there's ever been a more creative uh, person in the music world, Western <laughs> classical music world. So when you're that creative, it's hard to imagine that you're not open-minded. So I, I've come to peace with that. Um, these kind of mandolins didn't exist, but other kinds of plucked instruments did. He mm -hmm. loved the lute, he wrote for the lute. Uh, Leopold Weiss was a great lutenist and composer. They were dear friends. Um, I, I think that you just have to, you just have to come at it from your own, your own place. You have to educate yourself as much as you can about the time period and about the music and, and read as much as you can and just put all of that, talk to as many people, listen to as much of many people as you can, play along with those recordings see how it feels to you. And then in the end, you you get to make your own choice about that. Mm -hmm. uh, um, it's taken me years to get to this point, um, let me tell you. <laughs> because there are so many strong opinions. Just the simple idea of whether or not you should play the music without any retard, or whether you should take time at harmonic cadenza points is a is a big one. Mm -hmm. Some people do, some people don't. And in the end, there's no way any of us will know how Johann Sebastian Bach played these things. Mm -hmm. And even if we had a video of him doing it, we probably wouldn't be able to do it anyway. <laughs> Fair because point. isn't that the case with most great musicians? of today that we have videos of. <laughs> Never even thought about it like that. That's so true. I mean, who sounds like Thelonious Monk? No one. <laughs> or David Grisman. Oh my goodness. <laughs> we can't, right? So true. So I, I'm kind of like, I, I hope nobody gets offended. I've certainly done a lot of work trying to inform myself I've asked a lot of questions of people who I think are brilliant about, who know a lot about it. Mm -hmm. And um, and I'm just going to go with that, you know. And and every day I'll, I'll probably learn more. I'll probably listen to these recordings I've just done in 20 years and say, shit, I want to redo that. <laughs> like Glenn Gould did. Right, yeah, you, he recorded those Goldberg variations twice, right? Once when he was right. earlier, once when he was older. 
and they sound right. totally different, right? Uh, totally. It's Tempo's different, everything. Uh, so that's called growing as a musician, and um, that's okay, you know. Mm-hmm. I listen to myself, my recordings from when I was really young, and it's like some other person. <laughs> I mean, it's, it is and it isn't. You know, I hear, oh, actually, that's where that lick comes from that I use still every day. Oh, God, I need to stop doing that. But aside from that, there's tons of stuff that's just it's hardly me. I know. It's just a snapshot of where you are in a moment in time, making a record. <laughs> it, yeah, that's what it is. And, um, you know, certainly I feel strongly about the mando cello because, well, nobody's doing it on the mando cello. So I, I feel almost a kind of obligation, you know, mm. as a crazy mando freak to do something for this instrument and then hopefully that'll inspire the next generation to say i am not gonna play it like mr marshall i got my whole other idea here he was wrong 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 okay i'll loan him the instrument let go for it dude (laughs) well speaking of this this amazing instrument the mandocello like I'm not even familiar with your history with the instrument. Like, what got you into that particular monster, and 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 how did you get the one that you have here? Actually, in Florida, my first teacher had us playing some of those mandolin, two mandolin guitar Italian trios nice. that you can see published from the teens, from the great period, and. I think we had a mandola in there. He might have even had a mandocello because he was he had a music store of his own. And so instruments would come through. But it was very brief, if at all. And then when I showed up at David's, he had this beautiful K4 mm. mandocello. And um, I just fell in love with it and started playing it in the group. In fact, I have the Monleon here. Let me... The mandocello... Of mandocellos, it really is. I mean, this this. So I had John Monleon build me this shortly after joining Gerismans group. I don't know if I had left the group by the time I got it or not. But this thing showed up, and it was at that point that I realized, because it was such a great instrument and in a way kind of easy to play compared to the Gibsons with the bigger necks. Now, David had shaved his neck down on his K4, Mm. so it was a little bit more manageable. But this one has just a very sweet, easy to play. That's so thin. And, um. um, It was at that point that I realized it's possible to have a mandolin quartet because of this instrument. Like, this thing will carry the low end Mm -hmm. in a string quartet situation. And so I started the Modern Mandolin Quartet, basically, because of this instrument. Found guys who could read all those crazy clefs, <laughs> alto clef on the mandola, because I wanted to play string quartet music. The first piece I played was, I overdubbed all the parts on the Ravel second movement to the string quartet. That's the gorgeous movement, yeah. Uh. On my first album, because I didn't, didn't know anybody who could play <laughs> all that stuff yet. I just was inspired. I don't know what it was about the mandolin and the whole mandolin family just just really got me going because I I felt like well it was this like lost instrument in in classical music certainly mm-hmm. um, after having its great heyday in the teens and up through the twenties um, and then kind of falling into uh, the folk music realm and bluegrass which is glorious but it just took it in this other direction and what's been great is to look at that and realize that we've kind of come out of that period and now we're kind of back into a super refined technique and a real advanced harmonic thing Mm 
Mm -hmm. But now we're bringing all of that bluegrass and funk and uh, African influence to the mandolin that maybe that first generation of American classical mandolinist had no clue about. Mm. So the music is much more broad now, the possibilities, just the idea of the mandolin as a rhythm instrument, um, thanks to, you know, Bill Monroe and the F5 mandolin, just that design. And it's crazy because it's designed to chop, you know, but it wasn't built for that. <laughs> You know, the chop didn't exist. Bluegrass didn't exist <laughs> when Lloyd Lord built this thing. <laughs> it's just wild that, a, that an instrument like comes into being at a time when the mandolin's kind of falling out of favor. <laughs> and then somebody picks it up 10 years later and goes, wow, I can drive my band with this thing. It's much better than an F4, you know, with the round hole. So, uh, Lloyd Lohr, the grandfather of bluegrass. <laughs> sure, sure. Uh, unknowingly. Exactly. Um, well, I, lo I love this idea of the relationship between the luthier and the, and the music. How us as musicians can ask a luthier for something. Or maybe there's just some crazy luthiers out there building things that... Um, like my 10-string mandolin. I mean, I think that it's not really good for bluegrass, but it is a wild and cool instrument. And I think if I spent more time on it, basically it needs a new kind of music that hasn't been invented yet. Mm. I mean, Hamilton to Holanda is kind of doing that, but I think you could argue that there's another direction that could go with a F style, you know, carved top instrument that, uh, we need to, somebody's going to explore someday. <laughs> I look forward to hearing it, man. Yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness. I was looking through your discography before I hopping on here and I was just blown away by the amount of collaborations that you've done over your amazing career. And I'm, I'm sure many more to come, but what, what's, I know the main inspiration for you to collaborate with all these different people. Mainly they just call me and ask me to play with them. That's so cool. I guess. I mean, most of the projects, or Daryl and Anger and I think it up. <laughs> I mean, when you think about, like, Daryl and I's relationship in and of itself was the impetus for him to start the Turtle Island String Quartet and me to start the Modern Mandolin Quartet. We goaded each other on to do those things and encouraged each other. So there was that, but then we'd come back together as a duo, then we'd create the Montreux Band, mm -hmm with his then wife, Barbara Higby, Michael Mannering shows up with Michael Hedges. There was this whole scene of new age music in the Bay Area. We loved Michael's bass playing. We were writing music kind of in that band. Then we leave that situation or the record business changes <laughs> for, you know, a myriad of reasons, mm -hmm. like the, rec the music business does that from time to time. I think Psychograss then started. So we always loved Tony Trishka. We played on his records. He'd hired us to play on his records for years. We'd worked with Todd Phillips many times. Um, I'm not sure how we met Joe Craven, but he was in the Bay Area. So the first record was with Joe. Mm -hmm. And we just said, let's get together and do this. And then many years later, Daryl um, wanted to do a, a solo record. And he said, no, it should be a psychograss record, but I, I want to have guitar. We should have David. You, you heard of this guy, David Greer? <laughs> I mean, David had just kind of come in the scene and, you know, he's such a crazy monster. We just thought he would fit in perfectly with our sensibilities. You know, a lot of what makes a good collaboration is just musicians who agree on a certain aesthetic. Mm -hmm. You know, like Psychograss goes pretty far from a traditional bluegrass standpoint. Mm -hmm. um, and people often ask me, like, 
is it okay to play like that? You know, well, no, it's no. not. <laughs> it's not okay to play like that if you're playing with Del McCurry. And I would never do that if I was in a traditional bluegrass context. Mm -hmm. I would play to the musicians I was playing with. If it's old time music and everyone's just playing the melody and grooving it, you know, you don't need to do that Zeke Booba stuff over that. <laughs> so, but we found each other and we found uh, that we had similar senses of humor and we wanted to stretch. We wanted to see where else could this stuff go. That's definitely always been my MO. I've mostly been interested in like, what else can we do on these instruments that hasn't been done before? Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I love the traditional music. You know, so there is definitely a conflict there. I think in any musician between tradition and innovation, especially now that I'm living in Germany, I'm sort of the, I'm the carrier of the flag of this music. So I have a very different role when I, present myself here, which might be more traditional than I would at Rocky Grass, where I just played with Bela and Edgar and we played the Uncommon Ritual stuff. I'll let Tim O'Brien and Del McCurry do the singing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> if they're anywhere in the same country. <laughs> yeah, what's it like here in Germany? That's where you're at right now, I didn't even say. Oh yeah, I'm in Wuppertal, Germany, near Cologne. Um, it's fall, it's gray skies, it's dark, <laughs> it's coming into winter. It's a great time to learn a new Bach cello suite. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, Katerina's teaching her class, and, and um, so I'm good friends with all the students, and sometimes we play together as an ensemble and work up a show for, for the university. Mm -hmm. um, I also teach a class at the conservatory, uh, improvisation and Brazilian choro music for classical musicians. Wow! So, so that's a that's a great scene because you know these young people have never heard any of this music. They've never played chords on the mandolin. Whoa! It's a whole different approach that they grow up with here. Mm. It's a it's a melodic instrument, um, and so here I am going no. Check it out. You can groove with these things. Is it okay to play it like that? You know? Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> exactly. So I've had to develop a lot of tricks for for breaking them out of their shell because it's, it's very scary. You know, you can't just say, take it. Um, they, don't, they don't have the tools or any of the ideas or the repertoire, you know, the vocabulary of a musical style. Mm -hmm. So... Um, it's baby steps, and um, but I'm hoping that I'm turning some folks on to the possibilities. And it's it's actually a mix because she has had a couple of students who came up from Venezuela and Colombia who grew up on that music, their traditional wow. music. So those guys can groove like crazy and and play guitar and play chords and um, and then you might have someone else who's like what is going on here? This is wild. You know? But one of, the, one of the things that's nice about Brazilian Choro is that if a classical musician just reads those tunes off the chart, that sounds great. I mean, even if they just play them with a straight rhythm without any swing to them, I mean, it's, it's a straighter style in a, in a way than bluegrass. And so um, if I'm playing the rhythm and they just read, that was, we can get we can get it going. All right, I have a big question. You you know the mandolin industry so well. I mean, like you teach so much in Germany, but also online through Artist Works. You've done all these yeah. amazing collaborations, different projects over the year. You're basically like the face of mandolin education. I'd say like I've learned so much from you. Oh, well, sweet for you to say. Well, like what what would you say the state of uh, mandolin is these days? Like if you were to get a state of the mandolin industry address. What's the future of the mandolin look like? What are we doing right? What are we doing wrong? What do we need to keep pushing <laughs> forward on? Well, you know, that's a big question, yeah. of course. Because when I think about it now, I'm thinking of it not only in terms of bluegrass and America, 
but I'm thinking about it in terms of Germany and what will Katerina's students do when they graduate from the conservatory. There's a whole world there. And then I'm also good friends with all the guys in South America. So I'm thinking about it from the standpoint of Choro, Venezuelan mandolin, Colombian mandolin. What are Hamilton, um, Hamilton de Hollanda's protégés going to do? Mm -hmm. So these are gigantic questions in a way. <laughs> totally. We probably need to narrow it down a little bit. Sure. And, uh, because what the German classical mandolinists would aspire to might be something very different than how you grew up and what kind of things you were going to try to do. Of course. So, I mean, I think these things are always connected to the business side of the music and how do you make a living. Unfortunately, um, there's always a connection between what you should study and what you should work up and, and how you should present yourself and, well, will you be able to have a gig doing that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, me, I was never thinking that way. I was always thinking that I didn't care if there was a gig. This was something I wanted to do. Um, maybe this comes with age where you try and be a little more practical about these things. <laughs> But when I was, when I think about like wanting to start a mandolin quartet in 1984 and make a living doing that, mm -hmm. if you did the calculation, you'd be like, dude, that ain't going to work. <laughs> but, you know, we did that for like 10 years. We made four records for the Wyndham Hill label and toured and, and played. We got an agents and they booked us in all these you know, sort of medium level classical chamber music series. And mm. they actually made it work. That's incredible. I think about the bravery that it took for somebody like Chris Steely to leave Nickel Creek mm -hmm. and start his own project, especially that first version of it. Um, which one, what was it called? Uh, oh, right. The blind leaving the blind. Yeah. Blind leaving the blind. I mean, that was like his Nickel Creek audience was going like, I what? Know. We thought we were going to sing along with your Nickel Creek hits. <laughs> so, but he kept pushing and he was passionate and, and made it work. And now Punch Brothers is, is a household name and people sing along with those things. So all these things, I believe they should be grown from the artist and not the music industry. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, it's a different time now. Um, and I don't know, I mean, I'm not so good at all the internet stuff and being on Facebook and Instagram. And it's awful. Don't do it. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I, I probably should do more, but <laughs> I'm really grateful that I don't have to because I'd rather, I'd rather teach the way I teach. And, and in fact, even as a young kid, 17, 18, I was teaching at the local music store at, and instead of playing really cr weird gigs on the beach doing like cover songs <laughs> in a pop band, which sure. I could have done because I had all those skills, you know, I could have been in a country or a Eagles cover band on the beach. But I said, no, I'd rather sit home and study David Grisman and Sam Bush solos uh, and teach and teach young people and teach older people and spread the word. Uh, and I like the intimacy of a, of a classroom where somebody's really listening mm -hmm. more than a smoky bar where people aren't listening. Um, so it, it really works for me. I, I, I like it. I love my online thing. I mean, it's, a, it's, it, it's really enabled me to have this kind of freedom. And at the same time, I mean, the reach is crazy. I mean, I've got students all over the world, you know, oh, <laughs> and uh, it's a very cool when they when they really get it and they and they get better. It's so exciting for me to see it work. I don't know if you remember, but like twelve years ago, Babyface David sent me a video of that uh, like G minor. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> you played that whole damn thing, man. You killed it. I can't do it anymore. I uh, I've probably gotten a lot worse since then, but um. <laughs> Awesome. I hope I gave you a little insight, but I probably didn't have much to say. No. I'm sure I gave you a standing ovation. Uh, well, it was just so <laughs> cool to have you know, my hero give me input on a really difficult piece that I was working on, give me a really helpful direction. Uh, I know oh, so many other great. people are benefiting from that website, so it's, it's really amazing. How many students do you have on there these days? Oh, there's there's many many hundreds, David. I mean, it's it's really crazy. Of course, it's changing all the time, but it's uh, it's it's a very very great reach, and you know, bless uh, artist works. Patricia Butler actually recently retired, so now John Graves is in charge, and he's been there f from the beginning, and he's he really gets it. He's got the right head about what this is all about. And, um, you know, but it's funny because I think still people don't quite understand how it works. A lot of people don't understand what a video exchange is. Mm -hmm. we've, we've had a lot of difficulty, I think, in terms of the promotion of the thing. People probably think it's a Skype lesson, a lot. Uh, I gotcha. The idea of you send, you make a video of yourself, you send it to me, to a secret uh, website, I watch it, I then make another video explaining to you what you can do better, and then these two get put up on the website, and anyone can watch that. Yeah, That's a lot to explain. It is, but I love it. It makes so much sense once you get into it, and it's so much more focused and, I think, helpful in the long run, just because you know, you're playing for your hero, and they get to give you this real feedback about your performance and what you can do better. Yeah, it can be real specific to you. Otherwise, I mean, it, all the other ways of learning are basically the same thing as watching a DVD. Right. Which is, you, do, you just put it on, either through a website or a DVD, and you watch it, and you hope you're doing it right. <laughs> but it's amazing how, how many people I have to say the same thing to, many uh. of them. Because... I think you can't see it in yourself when you're doing it. Mm -hmm. Playing an instrument is a difficult thing, you know. There's, there's a lot firing up there. And uh, for people to, to know that they're crunching their hand in some way or they're holding a pick some way, they, they just, it's too much for them to notice. Yeah, you just don't, don't know what you don't know, right? Yeah, it's like you can't, can't know that until someone tells you. <laughs> That's that's kind of it. I mean, some supernatural talents are able to dissect it for themselves and go, that's not working. What's going on there? Right. You know, and, and find a solution. In fact, when I think about some of the great players I've played with, uh, when I think about Bela Fleck or, or Edgar or, or Chris and the work we did together when they were pushed to their wall, you know, technically... Mm -hmm. They were pretty good at figuring out why something wasn't working. It wasn't just hard hammering hours always. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it was an intellectual thing that got them through it. Yeah, I've heard Bela say that playing the banjo just boils down to troubleshooting. <laughs> and I feel like that's true about the mandolin too, or any instrument really. You just have to you know, analyze what's going on. And if something's not working, try something different until it does. <laughs> that, that's it. <laughs> That's really it. Um, this box stuff has really been that for me. You know, again, the fingering stuff. Like I used to write in fingerings right away when I sit down with a new piece. I go, yeah, this is, the, this is how I should do that. Okay. And then I'd try and play it because I wrote the fingering in. That, that's the fingering. <laughs> and then I'd realize that is not the fingering. You know? <laughs> and I'd erase everything. And then I'd be, and then I'd, it would like free me. And I would then come at it again with like, what is really going on here? And what do I need to do? Let me not get locked in too early on. It's working much better on, on suite number four. <laughs> <laughs> I think I only wrote three fingers in. <laughs> oh, I, I feel so bad. I've been like making you do all the talking with all the questions and whatnot, but you have like these amazing, it. you have these amazing instruments right there at, at oh. your fingertips. Is, is there anything that you'd be up for playing for us today? Well, 
I, I'm always up for playing, but um, I don't know how good it will sound, but I was thinking about playing along with some play-along tracks because we can't jam, which really kind of sucks. I wish we could. If only. Um, just to give people an idea of some of the things that I do on the site, it might be cool. Like one of the things we have are these rhythm tracks that you can play along with. Mm -hmm. So I've got um, like, I don't know, I've got old Dangerfield rhythm guitar here that I've, that I created that I could play along with a little bit. That'd be awesome. I hope it'll be a good level. Et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so that's just me playing along with the rhythm guitar. Do you ever use um, iRealBook? Oh yeah, I do have that app. I know they have like, um, I haven't used it much, but don't they have kind of a bluegrass MIDI band that you can use for backing? Yeah, I mostly don't use the bluegrass side. I, I, I like the swing and jazz stuff. Yeah, me too. It doesn't sound um, too bad. It sounds like pretty believable or useful. Pretty believable. I've got There Will Never Be Another You here. Oh. Some nasty stuff there, man. <laughs> Can't pull off any of that Har Alex Hargrave stuff yet, but always working at it. <laughs> um, yeah. So that so a lot of students send me stuff like that, where they're playing along with um with uh, the stuff the jazz stuff. Got a lot of jazz tunes on the site, and then I had our dear friends Brian Rice, the great Pandero player, um, mm -hmm. and Brian Moran, a wonderful guitarist from the Bay Area, come and play some Brazilian choro. Um, tracks and they're actually videotaped playing that stuff and you can play along with them. 
That's awesome. So I could play one of those if you like. Yeah, please do, man. I would love to hear it. So the way I did it was, you know, these tunes always go A, A, B, B. And, and so I did the first A, the mic on, on the recording plays the melody and, I, and me as a player will play the rhythm. And then on the repeat, I'll play the melody. can't not smile listening to that music. That's amazing. Yes, yeah. sir. <laughs> it's pretty joyful stuff. That's Choro music, folks, from Brazil. I don't know how you do that. How do you, is it all upstrokes? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those Brazilians. One, two, everything's one, two. One, two. Just on, bom, 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 bom. Okay. Just on, bom, 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 Everything's up, right? Well, that's so cool. So, I mean, like, kind of giving us an overview of all the amazing stuff that's available over on ArtistWorks. I hope folks will go check it out. I'll definitely include a link in the description below for folks to, you know, head over to your site and get to work with you like one-on-one -on -one like that. It's, it's so deep that it's, I mean, it's kind of un unimaginable how somebody just coming at the mandolin, like, how do I deal with all this stuff here? <laughs> <You know? laughs> it's like, there's a lot. There's a curriculum and then there's, uh, all the offshoots that have happened over the years because it's been 10 years. I mean, I've done not over 8,000 video exchanges. Oh, my word. And so all that, you can watch all 8,000 of them if you want. <laughs> that is unbelievable. How do you do all that? Do you have to, like, you know, 9 to 5, just video exchanges every day pretty much? It's probably about 15 a week. And, you know, the thing is they can be very short because True. a lot of them are 5, 10 minutes long. My, my actual lesson, because once you kind of say what it is, you've said it, you know, it's like a, you can say it again, but, um, and the student can watch it many times. 
And that's probably the, probably the beauty of it. And of course, there are a lot of people who just spot a mandolin. So I'm, I'm, I'm explaining a lot of times, like just how to hold it and the pick and the, you know, the posture stuff, basic things. But then once in a while, I'll get a guy like you who rips something <laughs> off and I'll dive in with him, you know, real deep. On, especially anything to do with improvising and I start giving variations, then the lesson will expand. But still, 25 minutes is a, you can pack a lot of stuff in. I know you did for me, man. Yeah, I, um, I, I learned so much from those videos. As far as where it's going, we never really answered that question, did we? Like, yeah, what's the state yeah. of the mandolin? What do you think? Well, you know, then the, the other part of it is social. And, and that's the part, that's probably the part that's most confusing uh, for anybody is um, music represents uh, us mm -hmm. as a culture. And in bluegrass, that's a certain thing. Of course, it's very wide now because you have southern bluegrass, very traditional. Then you have Colorado bluegrass and California bluegrass and mm -hmm. New York bluegrass. There's a lot to it. Um, so, you know, you've got to find a place where you're comfortable and fit your thing into that. If you're going to be a jam grass band because you live in Colorado, mm -hmm. you're going to negotiate around that world. But I'm looking at things like, well, you bluegrass guys, you should learn to read music, you know? <laughs> You get a lot out of learning to read music. At the same time, you know, it's just because that's me, because I have gotten a lot out of reading music. Sure. But when I think about my heroes, like some of the people I admire the most in music, especially from that world, they didn't read a note. You know, some of them don't even know the names of the notes. Um, Vassar Clements. I mean, that's wild. You know, even Joe Craven and. A lot of guys, Tony Rice, you know, yeah. David Greer. So obviously there's a way to become a great musician without that. Mm -hmm. The flip side of that is I'll be over here in, in Germany where people can read anything. And I'll be like, why don't you know a C7 chord? How can you be a master student and not know <laughs> E7? You know, what happened? You guys, what happened? <laughs> So, uh, you know, I get on my soapbox and I need to give that up. You know, I need to just say, Marshall, stop. <laughs> this person lives in this environment. They're doing fine. You, you and your problems need to just, <laughs> don't worry about it. I'm a lover of all that stuff. Mm -hmm. I love reading. I love playing Brazilian music. I love playing jazz. I love playing bluegrass. I love classical. I love, book. I love the world, you know. And I love how it all interconnect, but I love to interconnect it. Mm -hmm. I, love, I, love, I mean, I, for sure, I want to be connected to it. I want to go to those places, find out how the music is related to the social part and the food and the dress and the attitude, and then understand the music more deeply because of that. I was just going to say, you embody that so, so much. Like, you were the person that showed me as a mandolin player that you can do it all. You don't just have to, like, you know, dip your toes into these different genres. Mm. You can, like, be a master of all these genres, and and you are. It's I'm, well, I'm not, you know, I am and I'm not. Because, I mean, there are cats that, you know, Brazilian Choro, you know, if you really want to go down all the way in there. Like I said, I know a bunch of tunes and I know how the music works. I do pretty well, but I, I'm not the Del McCurry of, of Brazilian music. But there is a lot to learn, and, and I've always been a studier of music. Mm -hmm. I mean, to me, that's what music has been about. It's been about learning. Mm -hmm. and, and so maybe that's why I love teaching so much, because I feel really comfortable with somebody's just coming to something because i've just come into so much you know maybe just to wrap up here i i wanted to ask if you have you know any experience or, or lessons throughout your crazy uh, career that would be applicable <laughs> to some of the watchers here like what's a piece of advice that you give to 
a mandolin player out there who wants to contribute to the state of the industry in the mandolin world these days. <laughs> wow. Well, listening is probably one of the best things you can do. You know, when we did the mandolin symposium with David Grisman and Chris Steely, you know, the first year we ever did it, David insisted that we have this thing called music appreciation, where we just got together with our coffee first thing in the morning and listened to music. And each teacher would get up and present like five things that they wanted the class to hear and would talk about it. It was things that they were inspired by usually. And, um, and that taught, you know, David taught me a lot about that, about listening. And when you hear somebody like Tony Rice talk about how much he's listened, and I know, because I lived with him, um, he would just put on records, you know, and absorb as much as he could. And he didn't, and it was mostly jazz. And it wasn't like he was studying jazz and getting out his notebook and his real book and saying, oh, wow, look what he played over the A minor seven chord. Um, he was just taking it in. So, so that's probably the one thing. And then we touched on some of the other stuff about being honest about yourself and what you can do and what you can and, and being your own detective in terms of figuring out solutions mm -hmm. For stuff, not being afraid to ask folks, mm. um, not being afraid to be a student, even if you're the leader of the, some band, and uh, to take a lesson from somebody or to, uh, or to just sit and talk about it and not pretend to know everything. Um, work on your upstrokes. <laughs> There's a very high percentage of bluegrass pickers. And, and just it, because the style of music is so downbeat driven, if you just get your upstrokes, listen to what happens. It's like a lot more there. You're actually speaking the whole line. But because we're groove driven musical style, and because we swing, mm -hmm. the upstroke's always going to. Uh, suffer and so it's surprising how how much I often have to talk about that in my I think you told me that office. in one of my very first video exchanges with you like 12 years ago <laughs> still working <laughs> on it still working on it yeah. um, no you're super even I mean you are you are you are of the generation of of even eight note player uh -huh. and um, you know don't be afraid to be completely unique I mean, my whole generation copied Sam Bush and David Grisman, and your whole generation copied Chris Dealey, mm. and understandably, because we are inspired and we want to sound like our heroes. That's totally normal. But remember that um, the most unique players of this genre are, are, are so unique because they're really um, just... They had their own voice that they searched for. Mm -hmm. John Hartford, Vassar Clements, David Grisman, Sam Bush. I mean, um, and so I learned all those Sam Bush solos and I played with David Grisman and had to copy David Grisman exactly because I was playing harmonies to him. But I always knew that when I left that situation, I needed to not do that not do those licks, not play in that style mm -hmm. um, in order to find my own thing. And that, that was a process, you know. So, and sometimes writing can help you get there, writing your own music. Um, but uh, there's already a David Grisman, so there, there was no need for me to do that. <laughs> It's a scary thing not to be David Grisman or, or not to be Mike Marshall, you know, uh, speaking from <laughs> someone who's looked up to your music for, for so, so long. Um, but it is so inspiring just to see the path that you've taken, you know, daring to be someone different and to really push the envelope for our instrument well, thank you, and man. carry the torch. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's an honor, man. It's, thank you. 
thank you for being a, such a cheerleader and, and playing so damn well. <laughs> Would you stop that? Um, well, <laughs> I'm only sad that we don't live closer and can't play some more tunes together I know, more, once well, in a while. Let's make it happen. But, uh, that'll happen. Well, Mike, it's been such a pleasure talking. Thanks for making the time to be here. And I do look forward to when our paths cross again. Folks, you need to check out all of his music, his tour with Short Trip Home coming up here in the States next year. And also all the stuff going on online with Artist Works, the stuff over in Europe and Germany. Be sure to follow all of Mike's endeavors, and uh, I'm sure we'll be seeing you real soon. Thank you, David. It's been a pleasure talking to you, man, Any anytime. Likewise, Mike. Take care. See you soon.